The Ottoman state was the last Islamic caliphate that at its height brought diverse Muslims together under one banner. Yet for a state that dominated world politics and created a unique order in the world, very little of its details are studied and understood by us Muslims. According to Dr. Yaqub Ahmed, my guest this week, this collective amnesia was deliberately devised as a means to consolidate the modern nation-state enterprise. I initially asked Dr. Ahmed to discuss Ottoman decline, but as you will hear, his rich understanding of Ottoman history takes the conversation to many fascinating places. Dr. Ahmed has become an authority on Islamic Ottoman history, and we talk about his research on Ottoman decline, his move from London to Istanbul, his quest to reorient a Muslim thinking of history, the phenomenon that is Erturul, and how he believes any caliphate project has to be profoundly wedded to an accurate reading of our history. I found my discussion with him enlightening, and in many ways he challenged my previously held assumptions about Ottoman history during the latter period. I would suggest you take your time to listen to this really fascinating interview to the very end. As always, we value your feedback. You can leave a comment on our website. We also request that if you like the show, please alert others to it, and please leave a review on Apple Podcasts. This helps us in the podcast rankings. Whereabouts in the UK are you from? So I was born in South London, Clapham. So I, used to, I was born and raised in Clapham. What? I went to school in Tooting, so South London, really. My mum, since I've moved, my mum moved to Tooting. She preferred it being in a more indo pack area. So South London is, is where I've, I'm normally based. Alhamdulillah, great. So, um, and, and how long have you been in Turkey? Okay, so I moved permanently five years ago. Um, but I've been invested in Turkey since 2000, 2000 uh, 10 so wait i came to turkey first time in 2007 8 after i finished my masters it was a very short stint i was here for about a year and then i moved to syria and then with syria because the war happened i couldn't return back so the idea was to, to live in syria i had no intention of doing a phd or anything like that i was comfortable teaching english in, in syria when i was in england um you know i i i wasn't doing anything and i was convinced by my supervisor in my master's period to do the phd so i did it and then when I finished my PhD, yeah. or when I started my PhD, I already moved to Turkey. But I was going right. backwards and forwards in between the two countries. So even my family yes. and friends, they, they, they were under the impression that once I graduate, I'd stay in the UK. They weren't uh, under right. the impression that I would move to Turkey. But um, that was the plan, to move to a Muslim country. Um, Syria had did that to me. So as soon as I finished my PhD in 2016, 17, I came here and I've been here ever since. Next year, if, if I don't, if I continue to work where I'm working at, I can apply for Turkish citizenship, and I think I'll take it. Very good. So, uh, so you actually did your PhD. I thought you had done uh, your PhD in Turkey, but you actually did it here in the UK. Yeah, I did it at SOAS. So I did my master's and my PhD at SOAS, but um, I was doing research in Turkey at the same time. Right. Okay. Excellent. So that that's where the Ottoman history comes in, right? So your 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 specialism, your research was in Ottoman history. Yeah, so my, my master's was in Near and Middle Eastern Studies, yeah. um, with an emphasis on Turkish politics and Ottoman history. Right. And then my PhD was, um, it was Ottoman history. I was looking at the ulama in the constitutional period, and basically looking at how, so that wasn't, what, what was my interest was I saw a photograph with the ulama in the Ottoman parliament. Right. And I thought, oh, well, that's interesting. Yes. You know, why are ulama parliamentarians, yes. which we don't see in Turkey anymore because they're, they're banned from that. Yeah. Um, Jordan is one of the few countries, there are some other countries in the Gulf that have ulama in it, but Jordan is the only one in that sense that has a significant sizable body. From chasing the question of why they were in the parliament, it forced me to look at the question of constitutionalism because that's the reason why they were there. They invested in the project of Islamic constitutional theory. The more I started studying about Islamic constitu constitutional theory, I noticed that there was a disconnect between modern Islamic constitutional thinkers and the Ottoman period. They seem to have had no recollection or mm. given any credit to the constitutional process in the Ottoman period. So it seems like they were presenting it as something which was new and nuanced right. and a shift away from the nation state theory when the Ottomans had already done it. So the question is, what happened? Well, why, why are we thinking this way? Mainly because... 
nobody reads Ottoman Turkish, nobody, so they became totally disconnected from the Ottoman project. So that was what I became interested in. I did my PhD on that. In fairness, it's a 10-year project, which I did in four years. Um, and since I've um, finished the PhD, I'm working on a book proposal right now, but I'm continuously like unearthing new stuff. So it's just slowing me down more and more because I'm starting to realize that the PhD was a good starting point, but no one should read that PhD and, and take it as if that's the finished project. I think where I am at the moment, I'm far more refined as a thinker in regards to that. And so um, hopefully the book can be better than the PhD. Right. I mean, there's a lot there that I want to unpack, actually, as we go along, because um, I, I do want to talk about this. This, uh, mm -hmm. I, I suppose it's the latter period of, of constitutionalism. Mm -hmm. and, and to what extent was that um, spurred on by uh, by Westerners and, and mm -hmm. a, a response to, uh, for one of a better term, liberalism and its impact mm -hmm. uh, and its growing impact on on uh, Ottoman thinking? And, and that'd be great to, to talk about that, inshallah, I think. Yeah, I mean, look, in terms of your questions, you can ask me whatever you want. It's not a problem. I mean, um, I, I'm, I'm really flexible. So I, I, you can ask me about the latter period. You can ask me about my work. You can ask me about the earlier. It's not a problem. Great. OK, well, we, we can we can certainly delve into all of that. Look, the, the thing is, is I'm not easily accessible in the sense that I like my privacy. I came off social media. I, I'm not one of those active academics who are activists in the sense of having social media activity. But I do believe in being um accessible in the sense that if people reach out to me i'll give them all the time they need you know i would say with at the moment there's a renewed you know of course you know pan ottomanism or you know neo ottoman ottomanism is uh is all the rage and you know you've got Ertuğrul and you've got various uh various sort of cultural uh outputs that are coming out of the out of turkey so there is a a general first for um reconnecting with ottoman history and i suppose you know I, I get I get the point that you know you, you're a, <laughs> you're a personal man you have a you you know you, you keep you, you keep away from the activism side but I would imagine you're probably being drawn into these debates all the time right you know look to be honest I did a debate only three days ago on the Palestinian issue so um, I'll send you the link um, and the thing is is for for me uh, my problem is I guess is unlike other academics because I came from a very working class background my parents were not academics. Uh, my parents were not, um, you know, activists in any shape or form. They're regular Pakistanis. My dad's from Uganda, my mom's from Pakistan. You know, standard educational background. So they had no intention of me even doing a PhD. And then there's me now who's, um, so because the point I'm making is because I come from that background, I can unfortunately sometimes be very frank. I, I, I'm not as seasoned as some of the guys. So when I'm asked a straight question, I hit it with a straight bat. I just go, okay. It is what it is. And even going back on the Palestinian question when we, I was being asked, because I was being asked from the Ottoman perspective, what's happened? Because a lot of people talk about the Nakba in 47, 48. And I say, wait, we need to go to Balfour. And not only do we need to go to Balfour, but we need to actually go to 1860, 1840 and see the emergence of Zionism in the region in its first place. And then how the Ottomans dealt with that. And then we see the knock-on effect. So my argument is, is that a lot of the symbols of the current resistance, like the Palestinian nation state or the Palestinian flag, or even the Syrian resistance against the state of Bashar al-Assad, those flags are from the British and French mandate. They're still, the memory is still part of the nation state. It's not Ottoman at all. Um, the only Ottoman memory they have is the sort of like nation state propaganda. So even in these moments, as you said, you're right, I get called into them, I get dragged into them, I can't escape it. And that's because, unfortunately, we don't have enough Muslim Ottoman historians, you know, in the West anyway. In Turkey, we have, you know, everybody's an Ottoman historian here. <laughs> well, well, I mean, that's very interesting that you, you say that. I mean, is that partly because the political project in especially the Arab world was to underplay the connection with the Ottomans because of the Arab revolt? And is, yeah. is that how you see it? Yeah, I mean, it's not just the Arab world. It's the, every single nation state that emerged from the Ottoman past needed to re, um, reconstruct a new identity. And the only way to do that was to discredit the identity that preceded, preceded them. And so once you create this um, nation that's emerged out of the ashes of the you know, decadent Ottoman past, then what happens is because the nation state models were in essence constructed by the West, 
imposed by the West and then institutionalized with the institution structures and culture that were Western. Yes, in some of the Arab countries, for example, they rebelled against the Western like powers and expelled them, but the institutions remained. Mm. So as a result, th that culture of, of presenting the Ottomans in that way became internalized. And then there's the humongous educational projects that came into being, which were designed to fashion a loyalty to the new state project, the new secular state project that includes the Balkans, Turkey and the Arab world and to shift away from uh, the Ottoman past. And what we see with that is not only a, a, a sort of disconnect from the Ottoman past, but a sort of disconnect from Islam as well. So um, this and this is why you then start to see the emergence of Islamic revivalist movements. They emerge out of this. Um, this it's not a vacuum. It's a response and a retaliation in fact, because they've already had an experience of something. So they're not necessarily fashioning something new. They are to some degree, because now they're responding to the sort of framework of nation state, but they're also pulling from a repository, which is um, something that they belong to. And that's the, the hybrid moment in that sense. But then you have, you know, generations to iron that out and use multiple forms of violence to make sure that not just on the movements, but on your societies themselves um, to disconnect them from that. So, um, that seems to be the, the general project. I mean, so you, you talk, you use the term Ottoman memory there, which I found, you know, really interesting. And um, uh, in your mind, is that memory coming back? So, you know, I had written an article where I coined the term collective amnesia. And I had a friend who's a psychologist who goes, how can you have collective amnesia? Amnesia is a phenomenon <laughs> of the individual. And I was trying to make the case, maybe I was using the term in a metaphoric sense, but I wasn't in some ways. We, we can have collective trauma, collective pain, collective suffering, and we can construct collective memory. And as a result, there's no reason to make the case that we can't also have collective amnesia. And the collective amnesia comes from being severed from particular forms of the past. Now, the reason why I say amnesia is because the remnants of that past are still manifest in these societies. They're physically still here. People are still attached to their, they, they'll give you family diaries, photographs, records, or a tradition. People will tell you my grandfather was such and such. And, at, and on many occasions, it's interesting, depending on what the environment is like, and I saw this in Syria, Egypt, and Palestine when I was there, if the environment is anti-Ottoman, then people withdraw from giving you that information. If the environment becomes a little bit conducive, where there's a where those regimes and states release their hand a little bit, people come forward to tell you, "Oh, yeah, my my father was a pasha and such and such." So it's intriguing how even emotion works in relation to the constraints that are put on them. And so this is why I use the term collective amnesia, indicating it's there as a memory, but it's it's dependent on the type type of pressure that's on them. And collectively, people can tell you all sorts of things, which is really fascinating in that sense. Um, and the TV shows, as you mentioned before, they help. They don't help in the sense that they give you a, a depiction of historical accuracy. But what they help is in the sense that they create a particular emotion in which people are becoming intrigued. And, and that's why I guess all of a sudden I've, I've become popular and for one of the reasons why you've contacted me. <laughs> yes. If it wasn't for these TV shows, I would my job would be you know, minding my own business. Well, what, what do you say? So you, you, you talked about Erdogan and, I, you know, I, you know, I must admit, I, you know, I became uh, hooked on the program and, uh, yeah. uh, and uh, like, like most uh, Muslims in, in the West, actually, a large numbers of Muslims in the West. And uh, uh, we, uh, uh, we devoured the program at young and old. I think it, it was one of those series that brought families together. Now, you've mentioned that Erdogan is not historically accurate. But it, but nevertheless, it it reignites this connection with with Ottoman history. In net, do you think that you know programs like Ertuğrul and and the Magnificent Century and you know these various programs, weak or strong, on on the Ottomans, help in bringing regaining that sense of history? Yeah, I think so. I mean, look, as a historian, I'm exceptionally critical of it. So when I'm teaching in my history classes, we deconstruct that show right. simply because we only have about five minutes worth of information to teach on Arctic. Yeah. But as, as fiction, I've always made the argument that you can sometimes speak more truth in fiction than you can in reality. And in that sense, because you have this sort of like creative license and freedom. Yeah. When I was growing up, when I was young, 
I was obsessed with a show on Channel 4 called The Sword of Tipu Sultan. <laughs> and th that was my generation's Ertur Dirlish. Yes. That's what we were. And for Hindus, it was the Mahabharat. There was this epic show called the Mahabharat, which was a humongous reconstruction of the narrative of the Mahabharat. We, we, we're well aware of that. But the serialization created a particular, as we said, a, a memory of the Mahabharat, which wasn't necessarily true. I mean, we can talk about Mahabharat as a religion and that, so that's different. But I'm talking about in the consciousness of the new Hindu that was rising in India, that TV show became significant for them. And did it is Arturud. It has done the same. And for me, what the show does, or what I find fascinating about the show, is not necessarily the accuracy of the show, but how Muslims feel about it. Right. Because for me, that's an indication that the fact that Muslims are so attached to the show is an indication of how they feel about their place in the world right now, which is that there are certain values that they want to, um, that they look for in their communities, in their leaders and their leadership. And Arturo represents that. And to some degree that um, you can see there's a sense of frustration in the sense that, you know, I mean, a footballer scores a goal and does so good, we get excited. Why? Because there's a sense of like, Islam is not being represented here. I mean, what, what's so great about a footballer scoring a goal? I mean, I remember watching a game, Algeria playing Egypt. And the person who's taking the penalty was Muslim. The person who's saving the penalty was Muslim. And they both prayed to Allah to save you know, and you're going, okay, well, who's Allah listening to here? Um, but what you realize is that Muslims want a sense of agency. And and I guess what Erturul did to some degree is it showed that years of tradition and culture, which the Muslims still have within them, they could see in a visual form. And in that sense, that's what the ideal is for them in that sense. And that's what they're looking for. Which is fascinating. No, it is. I, I think, and and it cuts through generations, right? Young and old uh, yeah. watch this show, and I think yeah. it is. It, it it has allowed us to open a door to Ottoman history, and I think that's that's very valuable. Uh, so let's start from uh, the beginning. I mean, I've I've called you on to uh, our podcast in order to talk about Ottoman decline, because I've been uh, brought up, uh, you know. Uh, in in my in my uh, uh, university years, we we uh, we were subject to academic discourses on uh, Ottoman decline, and uh, Bernard Lewis uh, is always used, especially here in in, in Britain, uh, and his thoughts about why the Ottomans ended up where they where they are, and he argues that there was a there was a sort of linear process of of gradual decline. And I think it's right, that, and you, you know better than I do about, you know, the, the sort of the Orientalist discourse on Ottoman decline, but it was, you know, they, they put it down to a failure in thinking and a failure to modernise. Uh, and partly they put that failure in uh, an Ottoman connection with Islam. Uh, so, you know, to put it simply, Islam was held by Ottomans, Ottomans, Ottomans were deeply conservative, uh, the Industrial Revolution takes place, uh, the Enlightenment uh, precedes that revolution, the West and Europe are, are, uh, are, are moving forward in terms of thought and technology and science, and the Ottomans remain stubbornly connected and wedded to, to Islam. Um, to, you know, we, there's a lot there to unpack, of course, but in, in its general sense, um, do you agree, even if we dislike it, do you agree with that analysis of Ottoman decline? No. Um, there's two reasons for that. Um, I understand why Muslims feel why why that works for the Muslim palate, because we're actually judging the Ottoman past from how we feel right now, today. And so we're trying to make the sense, trying to make sense of the world we live in today. And the way that we can make sense of it is to look back on that particular narrative. And it goes, yeah, of course, those guys, they failed us. And they were in this rapid decline and so forth. But it's like asking the question, is America in decline? How do you make sense of that question? How, what parameters are you using to measure it? And um, with a machinery that works so slowly, I mean, when did the American decline begin then? Right? And that's the same thing, what Lewis did. And his student, Carter Finley, I remember speaking to him. He came to Turkey. And he accepted the fact, he openly told us, that Lewis invented that. And he admitted he invented that. But it, what Lewis was good at was he was a fantastic storyteller. And this is one of the interesting things about history, which is narrative matters and the way that you tell the narrative. 
And Lewis was popular at a particular time where Ottoman history didn't have the same level of agency um, in many parts of, of the world in that sense. And so um, Lewis could be a powerhouse in regards to his writing of not only Ottoman history, but Islam. Now he was critiqued by, let's just say, Edward Said. Edward Said actually really went after Lewis, calling him out as an Orientalist. And what's interesting is that many academics, especially Muslims, recognized that Lewis was an Orientalist, but nonetheless still continued to, um, to push the narrative of Ottoman decline. So it was strange. On the one hand, they recognized he was an Orientalist, but on the other hand, they were unable to or unwilling to unpack this construction that he'd put forward regarding Ottoman decline in that sense. Now, what's intriguing is that the reason why I say no is because it would be, there would be a problem in my profession because at the moment in the field of Ottoman history, multiple academics, both Muslim and non, in multiple spheres are rejecting the idea of the decline paradigm. It's called the decline paradigm by suggesting that um, what are the parameters first to measure decline? Now for Muslims, let's just put academia to a side for a second, I would equally ask for Muslims, what is it that they're looking for regarding Ottoman decline, apart from military decline or, or you know, or um, what you could call um, expansionism season, right? In the sense that we could argue, and there's enough arguments to be made, for example, let's look, the ulama of the 18th, 19th century were far more intellectual than the ulama of the 15th, 16th century. So in that sense, something's working. Right, there are more people being educated or were educated in the Hamidian period than they ever were in the Sulaimaniyah period, and also people don't understand the configuration of the Ottoman state, which is it's not one homogenous entity. The Ottoman state is a client-based system, which is you have Istanbul as a center, and then various regions and areas they submit to Istanbul and they have a reciprocal relationship. In that sense, if for let's just say arguments say Romania is lost. That's a problem in Romania. That's not a problem with the Ottomans because people need to understand how to, um, how to govern an empire that large, right? And it requires local um, sort of like um, assistance in that sense. And so just like how you couldn't, it's diff it would be unfair to blame the Ottomans on the colonization of India. On the same token, it would be unfair to critique the Ottomans on the colonization of Algeria because so much of the Ottomans' relationship with Algeria was dependent on the Algerians giving them allegiance. Once the allegiance was broken, the Algerians became colonized in that sense. And a lot of military power was dependent on locals. The Ottomans couldn't draw from an unlimited pool of people from Istanbul to govern that place. So it required local people to, to do that. So the point I'm making, I guess, is that in the field that I'm in, we're challenging the nature, the idea of what we mean by decline and saying that's not helpful, especially with Lewis, who deliberately tries to create this linear narrative because Lin Lewis was support. He was a supporter of the nation state. And so his argument was the nation state is the natural consequence of secularization. It's just the Muslim world was lagging behind the European world in that sense regarding Christendom. But it was inevitable that that was going to happen. And so. This is why we now say, well, is it inevitable? And just like in the Ottoman period where we have an interregnum period, which is Bayezid has his state, he's then defeated by Timurlain. And for a good 70, 80 years, there's the interregnum before Fatih comes to the table and then reestablishes his, his state and his father does it in fact, and then he does it next. Are we in an interregnum period right now? Right? How would we know that? Because we are only thinking of the day to day. For us, we can't see anything past the nation state. So if I was to posit the question, is the nation state in decline? People go absolutely crazy. And yet this is an interesting question that should be put to the table. That is the nation state doing its job. So in that sense, the Ottomans are a, what I would say, a state that continuously had the ability to reinvent itself. It was continuously transformative. There were no borders at the time. So it was shifting borders, shifting entities. And the comparisons are hard to make because from one given generation to another, the state is evolving all the time. And if we're going to use the idea of Ottoman decline, then um, is Suleiman the magnificent state better than the state of the Khulafa Rashidun because his empire was larger? That's not the yardstick we use. 
So in that sense, um, Muslims make the impression that um, the reason why this is in decline is because um, there was this collapse period. But um, I think we have to, both from my profession and as a Muslim, I'm saying maybe we need to start having a better discussion amongst ourselves. One, because the, the works of people like Lewis has been heavily discredited. Two, we, very, we have very few Muslim Ottoman historians who are willing to have, who have the expertise to talk about the Ottoman past. And so Muslims are still put, making a position from people from the outside who are positive in this position. And then in the field itself, um, both Muslim and non-Muslims, Turks and non-Turks are making the case that the Ottoman decline narrative uh, is just not helpful at all. And you are an, uh, an Ottoman historian and... Um... You know, like all historians, you uh, you primarily want to uh, draw as your historical resources uh, historical material, right? So sources, uh, official sources that belong to uh, various Ottoman administrative agencies. How much of that of those resources are still available uh, in Turkey? They're all um, they're all available. Really, um, one of the interesting things about so. What's happened with the resources is the resources still exist. Hmm. The issue is language. There is a disconnect. It's, it's, Ottoman Turkish is like Latin. It's a redundant language. It's not a language people use anymore. It's not a language that's exercised. Turkish is the closest language to it, but it's been it's gone through a lot of what we call the language and alphabet reform in that sense. So the the, the investment that's required in that is is one thing. But Ottoman Turkish is not the only language in which documentation was written. We have a large corpus of Arabic words, which people don't look at, which is strange and bizarre for me that, that we have. There are certain works like in Baghdad because of the American invasion in Iraq. Those archives were destroyed in, in, in Palestine in particular. The Israelis have taken a lot of the archives away from the Palestinians and uh, are using it for themselves. Israeli academia is actually um, very good when it comes to Ottoman history as a result of that. Um, and then we have the West. And one of the arguments I've continuously made is Ottoman history is a Western enterprise. Um, we have Ottoman history departments in virtually every good university in the, in the West that you can think of, both Britain and the United States. We don't have the equivalent in Muslim countries apart from Turkey. Question is why? It's because the collapse of the Ottomans was still part of foreign policy to some degree. And so, you know, we don't have the equivalent of, let's say, Abbasid or Umayyad history departments in the West but we do have dynamic Ottoman study departments. Um, so there's a lot going on in that sense, in terms of why it's difficult. Um, when I was studying Ottoman history in my masters, I was the only Muslim in the class. When I was doing my PhD, there was a regular joke at my university, which was he's the Muslim Ottoman historian, um, because it's still never, unless if you were to. Um, so it, it's increasing in the US more so than the UK and parts of Europe. There is a humongous disconnect, and the main issue is um, nation state, language and resources, and also for many Muslims who come from uh, migrant communities, being a historian is a privilege, it's a luxury. Um, but we are forced into STEM subjects. So all of these things collectively then create this sort of like challenge. Now, you criticised Bernard Lewis earlier on, and, and um, I suppose Orientalist in his era for... Um, creating a political narrative out of history. Uh, but Bernard Lewis would respond to that, I, I suppose, by saying that uh, he did rely on a lot of sources uh, at the time. I mean, I think in the uh, 17th century, there, there was um, there were a lot of written works, uh, forgive my pronunciation, the Nashihatnami movement, or a set of writers who criticised what came after Suleiman the Magnificent as being corrupt and decadent and and you know you know language which which really you know would would indicate decline i mean how would you treat those writers and there were quite a lot of them i believe they're not unique to suleiman they happen throughout islamic history um the ulama are social critics they do that every single time and one of the interesting things about muslims as a way of going forward as a way of um looking forward as a way of imagining the idea of how to become better, you have to critique the now, and you have to go back to a repository that has a golden period. And that's the, that's what you do. You say, these people are not great, the people before you are better. I mean, my mum complains about music. She say the music you guys listen to today, that's nonsense. What I used to use, that was music. And I'm doing the same. 
And so what you see is that we have to be careful of criticism culture as a reflection of decline. I mean, so the distinction ought to be made between one, in regards to what people are saying, and two, in regards to what is happening. Now, what Lewis was good at, as I said, because he had a particular ideological framework, is he took what people were saying and he, he put it into his ideological framework and made a narrative out of it. But it's very easy to take what somebody's saying and interpret it in, in relation to your ideological paradigm. And that's what Lewis did really well. And there were very few people at the time who challenged him because he was an exception. There are writers like Albert Ferrani and so forth who um, they, they write in a sophisticated way where they challenge people like Lewis and Gibbs and Owen. And they say, you know, wait, this is not um, necessarily true. But the real fight back comes about in American academia when you see Said and so forth. And now Ottoman historians, we have people like Jamal Kafadar, Dana Sajdi is another good one who, who talks about this. Um, but many Ottoman historians in Turkey as well, who made the case that um, a lot of the positions that Lewis was holding on just can't be substantiated without deconstructing that ideology. So, so let's then talk about Ottoman decline according to your reading of, of events, right? So the Ottoman Empire entered uh, what is a, a disastrous, became a disastrous war, uh, the First World War, and, and as a result of that conflict, um, uh, the European powers carved up the Ottoman state into, into the nation states that we largely see today. Um, what led the Ottomans to that disastrous decision to join the First World War? In many ways, the Ottomans were stuck in regards to the First World War. The First World War was a German enterprise. Um, and in many ways, this was a European war where the European powers were competing with each other as a way of having European supremacy and then global supremacy. The Ottomans are one entity. The Ottomans can't control the Brits becoming strong, the French becoming strong, the Germans becoming strong, the Russians becoming strong. And the main reason for that is because those entities use different sort of what you could say cultural practices to achieve their strength. For Britain and France in particular, it was colonialism. So it was extracting resources from other countries and nations around the world and strengthening their state. The Ottomans could never do that to their own people. Islam wouldn't allow it. Mahmoud II attempted something like that and it became exceptionally unpopular in which Mehmed Ali Pasha then rebels against him. And this is when you have the Gulhani Edict. Um, so the Gulhani Edict then is a reflection of the Ottomans can no longer confiscate, heavily tax, and force people into military conscription because Islamic laws won't allow that. So where do you get the money from to reform your military, to be able to compete with powers that are doing that? So then they took out loans, right? What the Russians did is they used um, aggressive or what we call autocratic modernity, which is they just said, this is how, just like what China is doing today, we're going to streamline this. We don't care what you think. And we're just going to roll ahead. Once again, the Ottomans attempted that under Mahmoud, but society would not allow that to happen. The ulama would not allow that to happen. So they had a different culture. So going into World War I, um, you can see that the Ottomans are competing with who? Russia, Britain, France. It's three entities against one. And then Britain and France, they had their colonial power. So they had an unlimited, you could say, resource of pulling soldiers from around the world. The Ottomans had who? Just themselves. So you have, let's just say, a population of 20 million. How many soldiers can you put on the table? Whereas Britain can go to India. Britain can go, France can go to Algeria. Britain can go to Australia, New Zealand. And Britain also called in the Americans. The turning point is actually the Americans when they get involved in the war, because by that moment, all the sides had been decimated. Um, the Ottomans, what they tried to do is they tried to stay out of the war for as long as they could. And then they were left with no choice but to side with the Germans as a rising power in the hope that this will be a short war because Libya was short, the Balkans wars were short. They were expecting this to be a small, small smash and grab uh, between uh, the Russians and the Germans and the Ottomans will stay out of it and that will be the end of it. What the Ottomans never realized is that the Germans did something totally different. They attacked the French first. They tried to catch the French off guard and that pulled the British in and that turned it all on its head. And before they knew it, they were now fighting a defensive war trying to cover the tracks. Um, so it was a monumental mistake in regards to um, miscalculating what happened in regards to the war. But now having hindsight is a wonderful thing. But now when you look at it, you can see why they made those mistakes that they made. 
but people often assume that they didn't have the military technology to compete with the West. To some degree, that is a fair argument to make, but they didn't have the manpower to compete with the West. They didn't have the number of, of men to compete in that way. And the fact that they held out for so long is on of, in of itself is, is a phenomenal feat. Now, what demoralized society was actually not the war effort. What demoralized society was people getting sick from the plague, malaria, and so forth. So if you're a soldier and you're hearing your wife and children have died from the plague, it just demoralizes you. you think, What's going on here? And the, the war stretched on for 10 years, which totally exhausted everybody. Well, it stretched on for 10 years for the in Anatolia anyway. So there's multiple facets to this in which that's what happened. Now, for Muslims, the argument is, is that the Islam must have been weak. Um, the, the argument here is, is that even in that period, a, a, a position that's been put by the ulama at the time is the issue of competency. That competency is a requirement in Islam. And so Muslims, it's not just that they have to be God-fearing and have to walk on. They also have to be competent. And when the Ottomans are losing a lot of their competent men in the early part of the war, the longer the war drags on, the more, the less they have to pull from in regards to those competent soldiers. So it's just like Liverpool losing their whole defence in one week, in, in, you know, in a couple of months. Season's over. So where, where do you draw from? You can't draw from anywhere else, right? You don't have unlimited resources in that sense. And so this is part of the challenge. These are some of the complexities I'm trying to explain in that sense of why they lost in the war. But what people want to hear and want to believe, because it's more, I guess it makes more sense, is that they were declining for a long time. And that's why it happened. But all the empires collapsed in the war. The Russians had the Bolshevik Revolution. Um, the Austrian Habsburg Empire collapses. And in World War II, but in the France collapsed. And you have the emerging superpower, which is the United States of America. But, but then are you then uh, dismissing the claim that there was, fine, maybe... Uh, it's a far fetch to argue, a far stretch to argue that um, the Ottomans began to decline after the Sulaymanic period uh, up to, you know, the, the First World War. But wasn't there a, a, in one of a better term, a rot that had seeped into Ottoman society and and, uh, and had affected its politics for a good part of a century before uh, that decision was made? I think that's hard to also push um, simply because a lot more one of the interesting things we're seeing in the Ottoman period, for example, in the, from the 19th century onwards, is an intensification of Sunni Islam as being part of the Ottoman identity. Some Ottoman historians call it the Sunniization of the Ottoman state in that sense. We're, we're starting to see, um, if you read works by the ulama in particular, in the 19th century, they're far more wholesome than they are at any moment in Ottoman history. And, and many of the political developments are also of the same nature. But I think... It is fair to suggest that um, when the Ottomans did fail, there were some huge failures and huge losses in that sense. Um, so the point I'm trying to make is this. There are complexities regarding both success and failures. And the Ottoman states was doing a difficult balancing act in a time where politics had become coalition politics, where diplomacy had started to emerge, where... Western powers were creating allegiances by creating coalitions, which was new. And the Ottomans had very few partners to have coalitions with. All the other Muslim nations were colonized. So what do you do? Your hands are tied. So the only coalitions you can go into are with particular Western powers, but that leaves you at a deficiency. So in that sense, there's only so much they can control in terms of what's happening in the rest of the world. But they did make mistakes. For sure, they made mistakes. There were some, the internal struggles that happened between Mehmed Ali Pasha and Mahmoud the second was 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 unnecessary in many ways. We know why. Tell me about that. Tell me about that internal struggle. So on the one hand, I always make this joke that one person's uh, islah is another person's bidah. And so on. The, there's there's one faction of the Ottoman elite class that are saying that there's a need and it's necessary to reform the army. On the other hand, the, the likes of the Janissary and so forth are saying we don't want to change the status quo. And their concern was is that if the if the Sultan created a new army, he was going to become an absolute power and an absolute force and do away with the Janissaries. And who would hold the Sultan to account because Islam doesn't facilitate for absolutism. Now, and the Janissaries being? The Janissaries were um, the regular militia that was being used in Istanbul at the time that had been established since the early Ottoman period. Um, okay, so you have that. And then you have the, the Sultan who's saying, listen, if I don't create a new army, we're going to get trounced by the Russians. 
and the Janissaries are not pulling their weight and they're just not good enough anymore. So you have this dynamic of when you're trying to make a transition between old and new, how do you do it? And you can only, you're going to do it and you're going to upset people. And what sometimes I try to explain to Muslims is I don't think we sometimes um, have a mature understanding of the nature of violence in of itself, right? We, we, we have a very um, utopian understanding of violence, but violence is complicated and violence is in multiple forms. You can have legal violence, you can have intellectual violence, and you can have physical violence. And transition in states, when you're trying to take power away from one entity to another, there's going to be moments of flux and violence. Now, those moments of flux and violence for the Ottomans were very detrimental. And now when we're looking at Ottoman historians, there was just no way out of it because people are always going to try to safeguard their own interests. And the point I made before about Islam and Bida, okay, so for the reformists who want to transition the state so that they can compete the Western powers, that's what is necessary. They said, it's Islam, we need to do this. Whereas for those who are seeing the change and are not liking it, they said, this is Bida, this is an innovation. So you can see, even from the Islamic position, there's a, it's quite dynamic in many ways. Just like in the West, you can have like the right and the left competing with each other, like in the United States of America. Even in the Muslim world, we have this contestation of different factions coming from an Islamic perspective to make their case. But in the long term, that sort of contestation was detrimental to the Ottomans because it didn't allow them to speed up as quickly as they could regarding the Western powers. And the Western powers were very efficient in, and they had gone through their own forms of violence. The French Revolution is an indication of that. And it's an extreme form of violence, which the Ottomans never replicated in many ways. Well, what about then um, industrialization? Um, you know, one argument that's levied at the Ottoman Empire is that uh, since uh, European industrialization takes off in, in the uh, 18th century and uh, Europe and then North America industrializes, Japan also later on industrializes, yet the Ottomans fail to industrialize. I mean, t take me through that. What, why did they fail to, to, uh, to do that? It wasn't that they failed to industrialize. It was, that, um, it was that there is a hesitancy on how to industrialize because the consequences of industrialization means a loss of jobs and um, possibilities for existing actors in that sense. So um, the, the assumption is, is that the Americans woke up one day and said they didn't want slaves. It's not the case. They just replaced them with machines, right? But the Ottomans don't have a similar culture in that sense. They don't, they don't understand life and society in that way. So to some degree, the idea is, is that when you make tech, technology to some degree still has like a sort of like epistemological framework behind it. There's an ideology. So when they're making iPhones and Twitter and so forth, these are what you can see conducive to Western culture. This is why you don't see these emerging in the Muslim world, right? So in the Ottoman world, they're not making tech to go faster. In the West, we need trains. Why do you need trains? Not so that we can have a good life, because we need to move these resources from here to here as quickly as possible. We need to take these slaves from here to here as quickly as possible. So for them, the Industrial Revolution was part of a particular ideology that made sense. For that to emerge in the Ottomans, it's difficult, because at that time, the Ottomans are thinking of notions of justice. What is justice? What does it mean to be a just ruler? What is good ethics? What is good practice? So their worldview and their questions that were emerging from their worldview were totally different. They were not driven by capital in the same way. And so this is why it would have been impossible, not only, uh, it's impossible is a harsh word, difficult for the, to envisage something like the Industrial Revolution. And it may have been impossible for them to envisage something like capitalism um, because their culture and worldview was totally different. Having said that, um, when they start to notice that the Europeans are speeding up regarding this um, industry and so forth, they then start to have discussions about how can we use this tech that doesn't go against the grain of our culture and Islam? How can we embrace this tech and these machines and machinery in a way that it can be conducive to our culture? So they are a little bit slow, but that's because the process is, is it halal or is it haram? And debates are taking place regarding this. Can we use it? Can we not use it? And so forth. So, so how much of that was a mistake? Um, um, I mean, if you think about early Muslims, uh, we, you know, uh, Islam thrived because it borrowed uh, science and technology from other cultures. I mean, you know, we didn't we didn't see science and technology as as aligned to our 
Islamic beliefs, but rather we, we were able to very easily absorb these cultures as far back as, you know, the time of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and how he adopted the trench from the Persians and, and, and you know, um, uh, and, and early Abbasid period was, was very similar. So, you know, wasn't that a an intellectual failing to to reject industrialization at a very critical stage in, in what we now know as world history, right? I think that's a little harsh, it's just simply because mm. the Ottomans were aware of what's happening in Europe. They weren't rejecting the tech. It's just industrialization had a particular culture behind it, which was a, attached to colonialism and slavery. So I give an example. We talk about the Enlightenment. And the, the, what's, in, what's presented of the Enlightenment is freedom, liberty, equality, blah, blah, blah. There's a dark side to the Enlightenment. Modernity has a, a, a corrosive dark side of slavery, of violence, of, of stealing resources and so forth, right? And the Ottomans, it's not that they can just take the positives without recognizing the negatives. They are, un, they are aware that these things come in totality, um, but they're not anti-tech in any shape or form. I mean, the, the Ottomans are taking tech all the time. But one, do they have the resources for the tech? Do they have, can they build the tech in their own way? They have to trade in regards to attaining this tech. And uh, secondly, um, does, is society ready for it? Especially a society which is not homogenous. So we have, for example, the Hijaz, which is exceptionally nomadic. And then you have Istanbul, which is t totally urbanized. And we're having this all over the Ottoman Empire in that sense. So um, the tech doesn't come in, well, they, they call it multiple modernities, which is that modernity doesn't come to the Ottoman Empire in one day. It comes in different places at different stages and different times in that sense. But the only way the Ottomans could achieve something of the nature of the Industrial Revolution is if they had centralized their state because they were decentralized at the same time, right? As a large empire. But once you centralized, it required extreme violence to centralize it because of the resistance to centralization. And then once they centralized it, you see in World War I, the Arabs want a decentralized Ottoman state. So that's part of the problem. Um, it's easy to have, you know, the United Kingdom as a small island centralized, but imagine empire of that size. So it's not that they were against it. They were thinkers who are aware, well aware of this. And this is why, you know, the, these nonsense claims about the, the print press and so forth, about the Ottomans were behind in the print press. They weren't, actually. They had no problem with the print press in many ways. It's just that um, in Muslim societies, um, education was still very oral based. Um, so we in the West make the assumption that you're educated because you're literate. That, that wasn't necessary in the Ottoman period. The literate man would just read or give a Jummah khutbah and everyone would listen, memorize and understand. That was sufficient for them. They didn't need to read and write. So reading and writing had a different culture in the Ottoman or Muslim world than it did in, in the European world. That, that's not to say people didn't know how to read and write, but priorities were different. Some people went, were happy to be farmers uh, and so forth, right? So, and the, there's no excessive pressure on the Ottomans to do that. By the 19th century, they realized they need to do that. And so this is where you have the alternative schools. And then when you create your alternative schools, you can't put those subjects into the madrasa because you're going to destabilize the madrasa. And so you create a parallel system. And then that's another accusation thrown at the Ottomans, which is they created these secular schools. They were not secular schools. They were just schools where you learn translation, machinery, you know, and, and, and science and medicine and so forth, which so that in the madrasas, they could focus on ulum din and so forth. So, whereas in the past under Nizam al-Mulk, maybe in the Seljuk period, a doctor would have been, you know, an alim as well, but the world has moved on now. To what extent was there a resistance from the ulama uh, towards industrialization? I mean, because these alternative schools, I mean, you, you paint a very evocative picture of, of Ottoman society and various power bases that exist in Ottoman society and, and the ulama and the religious authorities of course have, have established very strong uh ways of doing things through their madrasa system and and uh they, that you know they, they do not want that to be upset by these you know the, these new modern sciences that are being incorporated within curricula um so, so take me through that was there a was there a battle between the ulama and the modernists modernizers at this time you know it's interesting is there's a battle amongst ulama themselves so I, I had written an article, it's not published in English yet, but published in Turkish. Um, it's, I say Mustafa Sabri Effendi, um, the modern alim, not the modernist, because Mustafa Sabri is a parliamentarian, 
he's a journalist, uh, he's a Sheikh al Islam, um, he teaches and he, he ends up teaching at Azhar, so he's a traditionalist, but he's able to use modern tools. That doesn't make him a modernist, though. You understand? So, in that sense, even here, like we're, we're really um, restricted in terms of language in the English medium to try to explain these, the, these roles. I, I know what you're trying to say. What I'm saying is, even amongst the ulama, the opinion was not homogenous. There were some ulama who were saying, we should do this. We need to reform this. This is necessary. Islam is not against that. Other ulama are saying, yeah, okay, Islam is not against that. But this is dangerous. I mean, do you know what it's going to do to society? And other members of the ulama are just saying, this is outright unacceptable. And they came from different backgrounds, different areas. So I give an example. I was explaining to some students yesterday. Um, Mustafa Sabri Effendi is educated in the Ilmiya system. So the Ottomans have a centralized educational system. And Mustafa Sabri comes through that. He's born in Tokat. He goes to Istanbul. He works for Fatih Madrasa. He becomes a Sheikh Islam later in his life. That's the bureaucratic system for the ulama in the Balkans and Anatolia. Funded by the state? Yeah. Okay. Right. Then you've got Rashid Radda, hmm. who doesn't go through the Ilmiya system. He's, he's educated in the Madrasa system in Tripoli, then goes to Damascus, and then studies in the Azhar in Egypt. Totally different system. Then you've got, say, Nursi, who's educated privately by people. He doesn't even go into any systems. The ulama are just training him and giving him private ijazah. All three of them, in some shape or form, are what you could say um, ulama, different educational models, different educational systems from different backgrounds and different realities. Who have, at and, and some moments, it's interesting, all three of them agreed on the idea of constitutionalism. And in other moments, all three of them had totally different opinions about reform, modernization, and so forth. So this was the complexity, which is, is it's like this dialectic struggle that's taking place between the two of them. And I, I, the, the reason why I'm trying to paint this picture to you is because I want Muslims and, and your listeners to understand that there's layers here. There's complicated layers. And you know, when we talk about the balance of power, the balance of power is not like a pen on your finger that's balancing. It's conflicting move people's moving all the time. And when one group of people um, are removed, another one replaces it. And then there's generational differences older generation, newer generation, and this is constant, it's constantly moving. And so the key for the Ottomans in the way that their success is, they've managed to balance all of these different institutions throughout their 600 year history in different ways. And this is what we mean by state transformation. The, the uniqueness of the Ottomans was to continuously be able to reinvent themselves in the new conditions and new reality. Unfortunately for them though, World War One totally combusted that. So you're putting a lot of cr credit on World War One in, in in the fall of the Ottomans, and you reject this linear process, and you argue that, uh, which is fascinating. You argue that the Ottoman Empire, far from being a a, a very rigid, uh, uh, you know, autocracy of some sort, right? It, it's a very agile empire, and it's transforming, but it's trans transforming according to its cultural and religious needs, and it, it needs to balance a number of a number of factors in society, which which is fascinating, really, and, and you know, I, I I think it it makes me rethink my entire uh, my entire view of the of the Ottomans and and what it was going through, but but of course the Ottomans do make mistakes, right? Because you know the the lack of industrialization or the failure to industrialize has an impact on the army and has an impact on on military technology. Um, what what about in in the so the mid nineteenth century? We we've got the uh, Crimean War and the Crimean War becomes quite important, almost symbolic in in Ot as a as a war which was won on technology grounds rather than on on raw manpower, and and I think and again you know I'm going back to my history lessons from way back right but I I I, I remember that um, the Ottomans really won that conflict with the help of the British and the British uh, had. Uh, the British had it, you know, it had the telegram, and and the telegram changed the way warfare was fought, you know, and and again, you know, uh, you know, all, it, it this comes very much from you know from um, Ottoman studies that come out of places like SOAS, but that war sent shockwaves, even though there was a victory of sorts, that sent shockwaves around the Ottoman Empire, because it 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 it. it was a symbol of uh, Ottoman the Ottoman inability to to fight on its own terms. Um, 
take take me through that. And, and and again, you know, please, please do question my rather simplistic narrative there. But no, no. I mean, I think that's a valid point. I mean, in terms of the Crimea War, what's interesting is that um, the Ottomans. So the way that they they take an army to fight in the Crimea War is they have to draw soldiers from across the domains. All right, and the interesting thing is, is like, so imagine, and I keep using these football analogies just to help people understand. But imagine, um, you know, um, in Turkey, to for them to get a team to compete in the Premier League, they have to get football players from Galatasaray, Besiktas, Fenerbahce to be able to compete in the Premier League, and they've been given permission to do so. Now, once they get to that league and they start playing, and they lose, then they start arguing amongst themselves. Right. And it's one of the problems the Ottomans has is not that they were arguing amongst themselves, but this uniformity which the Europeans and the Russians had established was something which was still lacking in the Ottoman military ranks. This idea of having a unified military workforce. Um, this was something which was new. In many ways, what the Ottomans usually did is local military men and local militias safeguarded their own provincial areas. That was sufficient. From time to time, when there was an external war, Istanbul will make a call, people will get together and they will go to these wars. But to be able to now compete with professional units, and it's the paradox of war. And what I mean by the paradox of war is like the more you fight, the better you are at fighting. So in this period, the Ottomans are in the moment of peace. So while the Ottomans are in a period of peace where they are not fighting their neighbors and amongst themselves, the Europeans are fighting and the Russians are fighting each other. And while they're fighting each other, they're becoming better at fighting because of that. So on the one hand, they're obliterating each other. But on the other hand, they are improving each other because of the very nature of this paradox of war. And so when the Russians go to war with the Ottomans, they do catch the Ottomans by surprise. Like what's happened here? And the Ottomans, and what's interesting is many of the soldiers who are from the Crimea, and when the Crimea is lost, they come to Istanbul. And they are now part of the reform process of the military. So they, they enlighten in the Istanbulites in particular, that this is what's being done. This is what we need to do. And the same thing happens in Egypt. When the French under Napoleon invade Egypt, then Mehmed Ali Pasha in particular realizes that we need to reform under these lines if we want to compete with the French again. So this is what happens. So you're right to some degree. It's not necessarily tech. It is manpower, but it's, it's, it's um, how to do drills how to fight, even clothing. All of these things were changing in terms of warfare. And the Ottomans realized very quickly that in their moment of peace, um, you know, the Europeans had actually taken a march on them. They did try to close the gap. In fairness, they did close the gap well, but not well enough. Now, you you quite rightly picked me up on, on the use of the term modernizing versus modernist. Uh, movements, but of course there was a modernist movement that developed in Ottoman Turkey, and uh, that so you know until now we've spoken about uh, technology and and adopting technology from from others, but but there is another process going on, right? There's there's an absorption of what we can call Western liberal European uh, post Enlightenment values that are being incorporated uh, into the uh, into Ottoman society. Um, can we spend some time talking about that? Yeah, I mean, I mean, talk me through that process and the impact of that process. Okay, so I'm one of the few Ottoman historians who um, is muddy in this narrative. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, I live in Turkey, and in Turkey, there are multiple ideas and multiple types of people that exist here, from people who are exceptionally conservative Muslims, to people who are middle ground Muslims, to people who are modernists, to people who reject Islam and so forth. It would be impossible to assume that in an empire that wide, that there aren't trends and currents amongst certain people that are looking towards the West and seeing a sense of veneration in that sense. And there were people like that. What's interesting, however, is, is that in Ottoman studies, the narratives of these people have been given far more prominence than the narrative of any, everyone else. And so when academia like Bernard Lewis and so forth were writing, they were writing spe specifically about these people. And so they became far more important in that as, as representatives of the Ottoman society and elites. 
um, to facilitate the nation state ideology, right? In reality, what we're starting to see more and more now is there were multiple voices of resistance against that. Actually, some on many occasions, Muslims didn't even take them seriously. They were a minority. But what's interesting is people make, make the argument that if they were a minority, how were they able to establish the nation state over a prolonged period of time? Because so many human resources were lost during World War I. So many Muslim men were lost during World War I. So many intellectuals had been killed during World War I. And because the colonial powers, once they subjugated Muslims, they were able to provide the upper hand to the modernists in many ways to facilitate that state. But prior to that, the situation is a lot more messier. And this is why I use the word modern and modernist and reform and reform. And there are some works, wonderful works on um, conservative Muslims now emerging, showing that they were actually... So I make the argument, for example, that traditionalism has a transformative aspect to it. Traditionalism isn't static. So taklid, for example, is not static. Taklid is transformative, mm. right? Um, what the early Salafis did, like Rashid Radda, is they made taklid a worldview by saying these people are taklidis. So they took a fiqhi idea and then placed it on people by saying they're blind followers in that sense. In everything. In everything. But in reality, um, you know, um, Taklid and ishtihad require one another. You can't have ishtihad without taklid to some degree, you know. I'm not practicing, I'm a Hanafi, but I'm not practicing Matab Hanafi like Abu Hanifa, you know. So in that sense, as Talal said, he talks about this idea of Islam being a discursive tradition. It's evolving over time, but maintaining this basis. Traditionalists in the 19th century, it's interesting, have that transformative nature to them. Well, I, as I mentioned, Mustafa Sabri, known as a traditionalist, um, is a parliamentarian, he's a journalist and a constitutionalist. Um, and in that sense, what we're seeing is um, the we have to be careful in the sense that a traditionalist in 1908 may be very different than a traditionalist in the 18th century, in the 17th century. And so one of the things that I'm trying to expose to Muslims is also keep, we must keep an eye on the transformation. And so this is why then terms like he's a modernist, um, he's a reformist might not be helpful because in many ways people are complicated. And one of the things that's taken out of the narrative is today somebody holds this opinion and then two years later they change their opinion because people can go backwards and forwards. But historians don't do that often, it's sloppy. What they do is they'll just take works of a particular person at one point and say, that's it. I can tell you now that when I look back at my PhD, I'm not satisfied. And I've changed my opinion on many of those points in my PhD. It may be possible in five years time, I'll say, no, I actually agree with my PhD now. And the position I hold today doesn't hold water, right? And what you can see is that even thinkers are like this, but they're not presented in this way. Once again, the problem I've, I've found more and more in academia is we need typologies. I understand that. But then what typologies do sometimes is they create reduction. And what I'm trying to do is I want to help Muslims to be more intellectually and emotionally um, complicated because that's what we require. I mean, I've read uh, Muslim sources that suggest that uh, when I mean, you, you've you've dismissed the idea that the printing press was a big was a big problem in, in you know, in, in the Ottomans. Uh, but but was there not a resistance as uh, technology was transferring from from West to East? And these students were coming back from Paris and London, armed not just with uh, knowledge of science and technology, but also knowledge of freedom and equality and democracy and these various new forms of thinking about uh, about um, um, about the way you build your political society. Wasn't there a a schism that developed? At least, okay, f fine, maybe you know in, in its earlier period, you know that the. The, the grades were the nuances were there but by the end of it by the end of the uh i, I don't know 19th century wasn't there a, a real divide between these two very stark ways by you know of of, of progressing as a as an empire it's, once again it's difficult to prove i mean i'm from england i was born and raised in england if somebody in turkey then calls me out and saying you know what you're from england we don't trust you you're not from one of us. You're not religious enough for us. We know that you carry ideas of freedom, liberty. You're a British spy. You're a British stooge. I mean, do you know what I mean? Um, there are numerous Muslims who are conservative in, in the West. 
who would al their alignment intellectually, emotionally, and spiritually is a lot closer to people in the Muslim world, even though they've tasted the Enlightenment ideas in the West. They rejected it outright. So even these thinkers that are coming from the West, the assumption is, is that because they've gone to the West, that somehow they've become Anglophiles or so forth or Francophiles. That's not the case always. And once again, they're complicated. Um, let's look at Iqbal, Muhammad Iqbal, or let's look at Mehmet Akif, two interesting thinkers, one from the Indo-Pak region, from one from Istanbul. They looked at the West and said, you know what, they admired them. But then later on, they critiqued them heavily in regards to, you know what, they were disgusted by the West. They were disgusted by their colonial policies, both of them. So on the one hand, both of them, you know, initially when they were in their own countries, looked at the development, said, that's what we need, then went to those places and came back and changed their opinion and, and critiqued them. And in that sense, you see a lot of this. And that's the point I'm trying to make, which is the thoughts are not linear. It is true that at any given time, you can find thinkers that look towards the West and say, you know what, that's interesting. And then later on, you can see that they've changed their position. So once again, it, it's, it, it's tricky to put your finger in it on, on many occasions. But what I will say, no doubt that there are um, a number of thinkers who are looking towards the West um, because there's the emergence of the new intellectual class that are not part of the ulama class in that sense, who have a new form of education, a new style of education, a new access to new networks like the printed press. The printing press brings a new culture to it in that way. And it does open up um, the mind in a way where the world is becoming far more globalized, far more interconnected, far more integrated, and so you're starting to see similarities, for sure you are, no doubt about that. But what I'm trying to do, again, I guess, and you're going to find me doing this a lot today, is I'm trying to muddy it in a way to um, help one understand that it was complicated, not just because I'm trying to say that as an academic. That's something that, you know, is aimed towards academics. You see, you always say it's complicated, you know, but it, it was, it really was, because this is a large empire. And in many ways, the machinery of the empire, if I can say that, or the state, it was still conservative. So in that sense, um, even though there were thinkers who had come from the West, once they came to the Ottoman domains, they had to curtail some of their fanaticism, if they had it, to fit into the machinery, which was state society was still exceptionally conservative. Now, the other part is when you look at some people like the Young Turks, when they come into positions of authority and power, it is true to, to, to make the argument that not all of them were pious. Some of them didn't pray five times a day, but they identified as being Muslim. And when it came to the war effort, they were far more conservative once they got into the war than people realized. So in that sense, you know, it's also interesting that we have the assumption that all the people in our state machinery are going to be religious folk. That's what the ulama are. But that's not how administration works. So they identified as Muslim. Some of them prayed. Some of them were religious when they prayed. Some of them read Quran. Some of them were just like eating halal meat and their wife was wearing a hijab and that was sufficient for them. You know what I mean? But it is true that some of them also had positivist ideas, no doubt about that. And then there were others who had conservative ideas and there was a clash. And we see this in World War I. It really opens up in World War I. And one of the interesting things we see in World War I is the conservative voice is often marginalized. And Mona Hassan has a wonderful book called, um, is it Recalling the Caliphate? Something like that. And she mentions, she started to give a voice to the conservatives in regards to how they were traumatized with the collapse of the um, Caliphate, which is something that a lot of people get shocked by because the only narrative is the celebrations of the nation state. And in that sense, it is true to say that the ones who win the war are the ones who have the right to write the narrative in that sense. And so this is why I'm once again making the case that Ottoman history for a long time was a Western enterprise. And Muslims had very little agency of writing about the Ottomans. So even when they took their opinions in Muslim countries, they took it from the West. An example, Muslims in India, when they were looking at World War I, they were reading Western newspapers as a way of making an opinion of what's happening in Istanbul. So they were still dependent on that source of material. So then you can find ulama in India critiquing the Ottomans, right? Because, you know, they'll say they decline, they're backwards, because what do, they, what do they have access to? The access they have is to English material. So even here as a historian, it always becomes tough when you're trying to once again deconstruct this narrative 
So it's hard for me to tell you what the truth is, but I can tell you what is not the truth. Um, I'm starting to see that more and more. And so now the reason why I'm trying to provide an alternative is not because I want to swing the pendulum the other way. Um, what we're trying to do is if Muslims can just at least have a more rounded and grounded understanding of the complexity at the time, then maybe today they'll have a more rounded and complicated idea of what they imagine for their future. And they can be, a, you know, they can understand, okay, this is what's required. Um, so, yeah. Uh, just a, a few more, a few more questions, if you, if you allow me. Um, you've, you've mentioned now on a few occasions, uh, constitutionalism, the movement towards constitutionalism. What was that and, and why was it, why was it needed? If Ottoman society was confident in itself and confident in its, in its cultural and religious uh, base and, and, you know, and, and it, it was, it was uh, constantly thinking about you know, how to incorporate new ideas and new technology. Why did constitutionalism become such a, a concern? In the beginning, it didn't. I mean, the Ottomans, were, some were happy to have the system that the British had. And they said, we're, we're willing to, to go down the way that the British have their political configuration. It's not a problem. But the more um, streamlined the political um, culture structure was taken, the more streamlined that the political structure was um, like shaping into, and the more the emergence of a new public opinion was taking place, and the more that literacy was increasing, there was a larger demand for um, from society and mainly from the elites who represented that society um, to have um, a political system where the rules were clear for everyone to understand. And so people are making demands about what is the job of the caliph? What does he do exactly? What is the job of the state? What does it do exactly? What is the job of the tax collector? What is the job of the administrator? And this is a, a movement that you can see is happening organically in the legal system. And it's happening um, in um, the local councils. So the Ottomans have local councils, this emergence of writing forms of documentations to create a sense of clarity so that abuses of power doesn't, don't take place. And so now you start to see an emergence of a, a intellectual group of people who feel that the Ottomans are ready for a constitutional culture, a constitutional caliphate, which would safeguard the interests of the state by creating or giving clarity in terms of what the state ought to be, right? And this is not only in Istanbul. Um, so in my work, one of the things I notice is happening in Egypt, it's happening in Tunisia, the ulama, the Salafi ulama are, are pushing this out there. So like the Al Qasimi brothers, Rashid Rida, Muhammad Abdul, and so forth. Um, you're having the ulama in Istanbul pushing it out there. Um, you're having ulama in the Balkan provinces putting it out there. You're having ulama in Egypt, I mean, I'm sorry, in Iraq making this case, amongst the Iranians. There are Iranian ulama who are making the case that Iran needs a constitution. The assumption is, is that this is borrowed from the West because the West have a constitution, right? Um, the reality is, is that while they looked at Western models, it was still very indigenous in many ways. They, they had to align it towards Islam for it to work. The constitution is a reflection of a change in culture, political culture that's taking place because of this new technology that you mentioned. So once the new technology enters the Ottoman world, once the Ottoman state becomes more streamlined, once people, people become more educated, once we have the emergence of what we call public opinion in the new modern form, then the politics has to reflect that. But having said that, when Abdul Hamid, for example, suspended the constitution, people just got on with it. What it indicated then was that the Ottomans were neither here nor there regarding the constitution. They said it's a system that we can have or not have. It's not a big problem. Where it becomes intellectual is during the Young Turk Revolution. Revolutionary activity idealizes constitutional activity. And so the constitution becomes posited as an ideological project because it's used as a tool in opposition to Sultan Abdul Hamid. How do you remove Sultan Abdul Hamid? You can't because the guy has been in power for 30 years and been an exceptional Sultan. So they then construct the narrative, but we want a constitutional um, so, um, caliphate because we are not included in this. We are being marginalized, the new generation. And that wasn't just the military, it was the ulama and other technocrats. You hear Kawakabi, for example, making this complaint, right? So you hear the complaint not only in Istanbul, across the board, in that they're making a criticism that authoritarian politics 
is 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 uh, is lesser than what they call shura based politics which is a parliamentary system where the voices of all the elites can be heard across the domains and that is actually a reflection of the change in times that more and more people became there was an increase of the elite class and the elite of the educated class and they wanted to be um, part of the political decision making process so it, it was going down that direction in that sense. And what about the role of the British uh, in the uh, eventual uh, dismantling of, of the caliphate? I know this is a, a subject in its own, probably, but um, you know, can, can you summarise uh, the, you know, because of, of course the, the the narrative I've lived with until to date is that the Ottomans were going through this decline. It took a, a number of centuries, and by the time the rot had seeped into the Ottomans, the British came along and. And through their machinations, they were able to take uh, parts of the Arab lands away from um, of the Ottomans, and then finally, after the First World War, they were uh, with the French were able to uh, to divide up the spoils of of uh, of uh, this this crumbling empire. Um, can you just sort of explain what the British, uh, how the British contributed to uh, the? the destruction of the Ottomans. I mean, the British are integral to the destruction of the Ottomans in that sense. I mean, the assumption in World War One, anyway, me growing up, is that the British are somehow, um, they're the heroes of the war. They're the protagonists of this war in many ways. I mean, you wanted to go in to save Belgium from the Germans. Okay, we get it. Okay, but why the smash and grab in the Middle East? Or the Arab world? You know, why, why did that happen? And why did you maintain it? And why did you facilitate the creation of the State of Israel in terms of the Balfour Declaration and so forth? What you see then is that the British never had um, um, honest intentions regarding the region. They had their eyes set on that and they were continuously being repelled. And the only way that they were able to achieve their objective was of a war of, a, of, of this nature, a monumental war. And what it was is it's an indication that the Ottoman state in particular was one of the few bastions that was resisting the homogenizing efforts of the global world order, which was the Europeans in that sense and the Americans later on. So the only way to, to remove that entity is to deconstruct it totally. And that was a, um, that was a risky strategy in regards to, for everyone in that sense. I don't think anyone believed that the war would go on for that long. I think the war hurt all of them. And what's interesting is while the British were, what you can say the, um, the protagonists of promoting this capitalist worldview, in the end, World War I and its consequence, World War II, meant that they lost the mantle, please, to the Americans who continued that, right? So they also lost their empire. But the British were, um, were instrumental in many ways um, towards the deconstruction of the Ottomans um, because they wouldn't allow, um, when the Ottoman state collapsed and there's a movement to try to re-establish the caliphate, the British wouldn't allow it for that to happen because they had colonized most of the areas where it could happen. And the Turkish Republic was not interested in that idea whatsoever. So not only were, and the British for a long time were trying to facilitate a propaganda campaign. You can see this in the works of Tufan Buspinal. Um, he makes the case that the British were sending out leaflets and promoting ideas um, of an Arab caliphate. And it was the British who were critiquing the, the Ottomans by saying that, um, the Ottoman state was not a proper caliphate in that sense, right? And what's interesting is for the Arabs, like Sharif Hussein and so forth, who were nervous um, of what the Ottomans might do to them because they wanted a centralized entity. And during World War I, um, they assumed that um, they could get a, a sort of decentralized state. They believed the British in the promises that the British made. Because the British are clever, what they did is they, they made them believe in the inevitability of their victory and the inevitability of the Ottoman collapse. And so then the Arabs didn't align with them, but it wasn't inevitable, but they projected it. And then it happened. So then you believe the inevitable. So first you need to project it before you can do it, right? And so this is where the British were really successful, which is they, they, they threw leaflets out of helicopters and all sorts. And they created alternative propaganda campaigns in India, they, you know, coerced some ulama in India, some in the Arab provinces to critique the Ottoman caliphate and so forth. This happened. And then the Ottomans were trying to do a counter propaganda campaign and, uh, you know, and, and it didn't work out. What's interesting is in World War I, when the Ottoman put out the Jihad Fatwa, um, if, if any of your listeners get the opportunity to do this, you can see it's online. The Jihad Fatwa is fascinating because the Ottomans made the claim that not only is an obligation to work with the Ottomans, 
but even the Muslims who are working with the, the Western powers, they are, they're going to, to hellfire if they work with them. They must rebel against them. That, now, that didn't happen. The question is, why? Well, it's the same right now when people say, if Erdogan just established a caliphate tomorrow, all the Muslims would move. Would they? Would they? And so this is the interesting thing, which is that there is a miscalculation that took place because there is a belief amongst Muslims that if we just have our trigger moment, then we're all going to move. But we have to be very careful of pushing that narrative out there, that we just need that one trigger moment and it's going to happen because the Ottomans believe that. And it didn't happen because, once again, people are people are restricted in their locality. I mean, we've seen what's happening with Aqsa. Where's the movement? We're demonstrating, but where's the movement? It's not there because usually you're occupied by your local, whatever your local interests are. And so that happened to the Ottomans. They put out the fatwa. They thought, okay, this is going to happen. And it didn't. Um, there are some thinkers like in India, like the Khilafat Committee that emerged. There are many Muslim soldiers who do refuse to fight, who get shot and killed by the British and so forth. And there are many Muslim soldiers, um, you know, who the Ottomans make the case that, you know, these are traitors to the Ottomans. For fighting with the British and so forth and it's a complicated situation once again but the British were um, very instrumental in the collapse of that empire. There is a um, there is now a, a call you know how how strong this call is is is, is debatable but there is a call uh, in the Muslim world and, and in the non-Muslim world for the re-establishment of the caliphate and um, uh, people as far as field as, as Indonesia today are talking about if only we were connected together in in as one uh, as one entity as one state and um, and of course uh, this neo Ottomanism which is developing you know uh, partly as a result of Turkish self power is is um, is is probably uh, helping that right it's 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 pushing that along um, how much does a study of history uh, how valuable is is your study of history to that project? Do you see yourself as an Ottoman historian in in many ways, not just as someone who's who's shedding light on the past, but actually you're aiding um, future movements for this uh, for this caliphate, um, you know, sometime in the future. For me, um, I don't know what the future holds, but what I can do is whatever imaginations we have today. They can only be built on something that's come before. Um, as a Muslim, I always t teach my students that Allah Ta'ala taught Adam alayhi salam the names of things. It doesn't come from a vacuum. Um, knowledge and information is built from what came before it. In that sense, um, if Muslims, if, if, if people are going to talk to Muslims about possible alternatives, about possible future imaginations and so forth, what can they draw from? Right now, what can they draw from? They can only make sense of the world they're in right now. So then what you have to do is you have to be able to draw from something that existed before. Now, if you're going to draw from something that existed in the time of the Khulafa Rashidun, that's tough for them. I'm not saying not to draw from that, actually. I'm saying it's necessary to draw from all of it. But I'm saying it's also equally helpful to draw from something which is quite recent. Um, 80, 90 years is nothing. And they are exceptional... What's interesting for me is while we can look at the Ottomans collapsing, that's not an interesting question for me, actually. What's interesting for they collapse, it's done. And when a lot of my students say to me, what if they had done this? It's irrelevant. We can only judge what they did. Um, if they have done that, maybe the European powers might have done that. You know, it's like when I'm watching, I was watching the Champions League final yesterday. They said, if only Guardiola had had two defensive midfielders, well, maybe Chelsea would have scored another way. So ifs and buts are great, but what I can tell you is what happened. Those are the interesting questions for me. They did this. They had a constitutional caliphate. They had a parliamentary system. They had ulama in parliament. They had ulama who were journalists. They had ulama who were ulama, and you can call them intellectuals. They had Muslims who were Albanian, Bosnian, Kurdish, Arab, you know, Palestinian, Syrian, working with one another. It was... There's a lot that we can take from in terms of what's interesting here. Migration, how it operated, inter um, racial Muslim marriages, how that operated, um, the emergence of networks, the emergence of power, the nature of war, the nature of power. You know, um, people make the argument that the ulama should be apolitical. I can make you 101 cases about why the ulama in the Ottoman period were political. 
because they believe that by being aligned with the governmental machinery, you can use the tools of the governmental machinery. And if you can't use that, you, if you're on the periphery, the only tools available to you are protest. And that's not what they wanted. So in that sense, there's so much we can take from it. There's so much we can learn from it. And what I want is, that's why I keep saying a more mature and um, healthy understanding of the past, rather than continuously trying to be judgmental of the past. It's irrelevant. It's done. What we're saying is, okay, what can we take from it? What can we learn from it? What are the interesting things about it, right? And in that sense, once you have this imagination, that's then you can draw an imagination of where you want to go. So if you're looking at movies, Star Wars, and you know, and so forth, where they're drawing the imaginations from, they're drawing the imagination from religious repositories, Christianity, Islam, Sufis, and whatnot, right? Um, in that sense, what the West are successful at, for example, is when they create movies like Back to the Future, they create a particular imagination, or dystopian movies like Blade Runner. Muslims have no alternative here, and Ertul was that unique alternative in the television space. I was watching um, the new, um, what's it, Winter Wolf and Falcon um, by the new Captain America show. What was intriguing is the American TV show, Marvel, had a way of, of they had a character who represented what you could call a conservative America, or Trump's, and they they gave him redemption. They they tried the, the villains in the show. They humanized them. What they tried to do is to try to represent that America, quote unquote, um, is complicated. America is nuanced. America is neither good or bad. America just does what's right. It tries to be right, sorry, and it makes mistakes. But we're trying, and it's intriguing that they use popular culture as a way of creating these imaginations about who they are. In that sense, I think that's what we can do. That's what I try to do as a historian, which is, as you say, is to tell Muslims that anything is imaginable, but you first have to imagine it. So it's intriguing. In, if today I said to Muslims that two states will come together, Iraq and Syria will become one state, they said that's impossible. But if I said to them that Syria will become federalized, that's possible. So we can imagine the deconstruction of states. We can't, we're not allowed to imagine the coming together. And I think for Muslims, um, we have to be quite um, creative with our imaginations of the possibilities of what we can achieve. And only then can we achieve it. And so for me, I'm, I'm fortunate because when people tell us things like the nation state is the only model and it's here to stay, I say the Ottomans believed that they had a state for 600 years, but it's gone. In fact, when the Ottoman state was collapsing, such was the trauma because they never imagined anything else. And when the nation states were formed, they were on very shaky grounds. All the rulers, of the, at least for 10, 20 year period, were nervous that these nation states are not going to make it. Mm. Because nobody, people didn't know any different. They had always known the Ottoman Caliphate to some degree. So what I learned then is that, okay, you know, let's, let's be a little bit open-minded here. Let's not be so rigid and restricted. Let's not suffocate ourselves in terms of what we can do. So the possibilities for me are endless in that sense. And I say, give the Muslims what they want, right? So um, in that sense, um, that, that's what I'm pushing out there. So it might, be, it might be aligned with certain political movements and so forth, so be it. Um, it may not be, but in the end of the day, um, I personally believe that it's a travesty that in the seminaries in the Muslim world at the moment, we don't teach Islamic history. Right. And when we teach Islamic history, it's just Khulafa Rashid and Umayyad Abbas, that's it, job mm -hmm. done. I've opened up a course recently in my university on the history of Palestine, only because I realized my students were disconnected with the current conflict. Mm. So then it becomes important. It's not just what's happening now. You need to know where, where this began, what's going on and, and the layers, right? Mm. And so I feel like somebody was mentioning me today that, bro, you know, look, um, are there any online schools for our kids where we can teach them proper Islamic history? Yes. So we teach them nothing. And it, it just shows you that why is this missing when someone like Ibn Khaldun made the case that history is part of the seminary curricula? It's a staple, you know, because Allah Ta'ala talks about history in the Quran. And the Quran is full of history in that sense, you know. So why have we abandoned this? I never went into a PhD to think this way. I was really sloppy. I just wanted to write a PhD on the ulama in a photograph, as I mentioned to you before. Hmm. But coming out of that, Alhamdulillah, if there's one thing that I've taken from it is that my brain has changed a little bit where I've recognized, I'm not saying that history is more important than anything else, 
I'm just saying it's as important as everything else in that sense, you know, and, and hopefully we can encourage more people to invest in the humanities in that sense. Well, you may have inspired some young historian uh, at uh, your old alma mater of SOAS or, or, you know, in 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 Western uh, countries to, to study Ottoman history. I mean, how would one go about that? If, if you're, say, you're in your first year of, of undergraduate study, you're studying history, um, you know, what what's what what do you advise uh, are the steps uh, to be the next Dr. Yakub Ahmed? Well, I, I said this to the talk yesterday. I don't want you to be the next Dr. Yakub. I want you to be better than me. Hmm. Uh, you know, I am very uh, deficient in many of the tools that I have. And I have no doubt that the next generation who are exceptionally intelligent in the way that they use the tools in social media and so forth, that if they invested something in the long form, that they can do creative things. I am critical of social media in the sense that, for example, how much Islam can you teach on TikTok, right? You have to be invested in people. You have to produce long prose, long literature. Um, I was explaining to some of the students yesterday that the Quran doesn't need to be a book. Allah Ta'ala could just have made sure that enough people in society memorized it and we heard it. But it's Al-Kitab. It is a book. There is some wisdom in that, in, in, in book format. There is some wisdom in long writing format there is some wisdom in being invested in your community taking responsibility educated the podcast format is an interesting format when i listen to like rogan and so forth the long podcast format is intriguing because what it does is it allows people to listen to something over a prolonged period of time and think and contemplate and go over it this is why i was more than happy to do this right um what i'm hoping in terms of the younger generation is that they don't abandon the tradition. There's many things within the tradition that they still need to hold on to. My argument has been, and I said this yesterday, there is an assumption that the more educated you become, the more irreligious you become because you start to see the light. That's not the case. It's just that education in its secular form gives no space for religion to be spoken in it. So the religion doesn't have a fair chance. The, the majority of the education you're getting from the from the age of five, six, seven, up until 25, 26, 27 is one form. Where are you going to get your Islamic education? From your parents? From TikTok? Maybe you go to a madrasa school in the evening? It's not enough. It needs to be a lived experience. It needs to be embodied in you. So what's embodied in you is a secular worldview. What's not embodied in you is Islam. So of course it's going to be a skew. Of course it's going to be a disconnect. Of course, Muslims are going to have an understanding of Islam like Dutch cheese. It's just going to be full of holes, right? What we are trying to do is saying, okay, what can we do now to remedy that? We can try to create alternative educational models. We can try to create online courses to fill that. We can try to decentralize education and do what you and I are doing right now. Students are still going to go to university. So I say go to university. They, it's still an... Uh, uh, a fantastic space where you can learn a particular form of thinking, but don't abandon your Islam. Have an alternative mode where you're still learning your Islam so that when you go into university, you understand from what worldview you're looking at the evidence from. Understand how to write in that robust way, in the way that Western academics expect from us. But at the same time, the ulama used to write for Muslims. Muslims used to write for Muslims. So we need Muslims to write for Muslims too, in that sense. And what we're going to need is... A, a lot of creativity and the creativity is not just we need to create a Zaytuna or Cambridge Muslim College. We need to be creative in all aspects of trying to fill these holes at the moment, of trying to give our young Muslim kids a more rounded educational experience, which is not just connected to the university. Because for me, the university is a 19th century model struggling in the 21st century. So ilm can be learned from multiple places. Let's get creative. And I was telling my students yesterday, my mother and father taught me how to love you don't learn that in school but that's a where's the certificate for that or to be morally upright or to be generous um or to be pious i learned that from my family i don't need a certificate for that but that what they gave me is equally important as what i learned in university and you can see in my writing too you can see in the way i speak to you right so um as communities um we shouldn't only assume that education is in the classroom um, and I guess that's what I'm appealing to right now. I don't, honestly, bro, I don't know the answer, honestly. But I think it's okay to say we don't know. But let's then start being creative. Um, 
So if kids want to go to uni, no problem. If kids want my help, they can find me. I'm in one way that's I never turn down help for students who want my help. And we're trying one of the things that I realize is that Muslims are needed still in academia, not only in terms of the, the knowledge base and so forth, but to also help young Muslim students who are necessary in that sense. And we are also necessary, we are not enemies of the ulama. We are working on the same thing in that sense. We're working together. We need to support one another in this sense because it's impossible for, for us and to them to be disconnected. Um, we need more Muslim journalists. We need more Muslim intellectuals. There's an intellectual deficit for sure. We need this. Um, so we need to support it. So um, I'm saying this openly on your podcast. If people come and find me, I'm more than happy to help. And how can they find you? Um, uh, you have my email. <laughs> so, <laughs> so they can email my show and, and I'll forward your Yeah. Uh, so the thing is, it's because I'm not on social media. And the reason being is because I became overwhelmed by that. It's just exhausting. And um, I, I want people to also, what I wanted people to do was speak to me on a human level, phone me up, come and see me for a cup of coffee. Okay, I get it, it's pandemic right now, but email me, speak to me on a long form. Don't just call me at four in the morning because you can see two blue ticks. That's not what I want. Um, because I want people to be emotionally connected with one another. And those older forms, there's still some benefit in it. People may not realize it. Um, for example, I, when I teach, I don't use PowerPoint. And people are always surprised why, you know, I want you to listen to me. I want you to pay attention to what I'm saying. There's still some benefit in these older methodologies of teaching. So email me and I try my best to reply as quickly as I can. And when I can't do something, I say I can't do it. And when I can, I'm, I'm more than um, willing to help because I want to see you succeed. Dr. Yakub Ahmed, Jazakallah Khair for your, for your time today. Um, one last question, if I may, and it's probably the most difficult question. You've lived in Turkey now for a number of years and you've made it your home. But it must be something yeah. inside you that makes you miss South London and, and Tootin Broadway and uh, the Chicken Cottage in, in Tootin. Surely <laughs> that's, uh, you know, that's, uh, there's no place like home, right? You know, um, I used to say home is where my mother is. Hmm. Um, and I do miss my family. But I've been traveling for a long time now. And I've come to the conclusion, home is where you make it home. You're right. There's, a, I, you know, when I come to London, the nostalgia, the chicken <laughs> cottage, uh, you know, the, the curry houses, Spice Village, my family, my friends. Of course, you know, they are part of you. You're going to miss it. But I think one of the things I've learned as I've got older is as human beings, we're, trans we're transitory. This is the dunya is temporary. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, I, I think as a traveler, I learned that and understood that more and more that this is a train journey. I'm, why am I decorating the waiting room? I'm just moving and then I'm going to pass away. So the idea is, is wherever I am to invest in people hundred percent. When I'm in the UK, I give my all to Muslims in the UK. When they contact me on social, on, on, on like how you have done in Soho, I'll invest in that. And when I'm in Turkey, I'll invest in Muslims here and everywhere. And the end of the day, just give it my best shot. I do miss home, but you know, what's funny now when I leave Turkey and go home, I miss Turkey. And I think there's always going to be a part of me that's always going to miss something, you know, uh, in that sense. And um, yeah, it's, it's a strange one. But um, as a traveler, I really have learned, especially in pandemic, because I struggled a lot here when you know family to, to fall on emotionally, that sometimes Allah is sufficient for us. Barakallah Fiqh and uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you and, and help you in, your, uh, in all your endeavors, Dr. Ahmed.